14 Things I Wish I Knew Before IVF. This is an article written by Sarah Ashley in honor of National Infertility Awareness Week this year. I love this article. But as a fertility doctor and a former IVF patient myself, there are definitely some points that I agree with strongly. There's some points that I don't really agree with. And I want to share with you all that I learned from this article and give you some insight so that I can help you if you're getting ready to start IVF or you are well in the midst of your IVF journey, this video is for you. I'm Dr. Laura Shaheen. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I am a board certified reproductive endocrinologist, means fertility doctor who does IVF and has been helping people build families this way for almost 20 years. And I'm not only a doctor, but I am, was an IVF patient myself and it helped me build my family. I learned so much from a patient's perspective. I mean, I got all the science and the medicine and the protocols and evaluating research, all that kind of stuff from my medical training. But man, actually being the person who is giving yourself the shots and going through that emotional roller coaster ride of the two week wait and all of those things, a lot of perspective. And I want to share it with you. So this article was written by Sarah Ashley, and it came out in the middle of National Infertility Awareness Week. It happens once a year. And this year I saw this article, I read it. I absolutely loved it. I want to go through each of the 14 points and reflect on them and let you know what I think, what I take away from it, and anything else that I might say in a different way. So let's get started. Point number one, everyone's getting pregnant except for me. <laughs> I remember this so well. Pregnant people were everywhere when I wasn't pregnant and I wanted to be pregnant. I would go to the grocery store and the person, the checkout line in front of me would be pregnant. I would look at the magazines and all of the stars were pregnant, right? There's so much mommy glamour, right? In our society. And it just sort of seemed like it was absolutely everywhere. Well, there is actually a term for this. It's called frequency bias, frequency illusion. A formal term for it is the Bader-Menhoff phenomenon. And it is actually a cognitive bias bias that when we are thinking about something, we are focused on something in our life, it feels like we see it everywhere. And it's actually all of these pregnant people have always been there. It's just that when you're in the midst of thinking about it and wanting it, you're just more in tune to it. So it just feels like it's everywhere. Number two, edit social media feeds. This is such an important thing. And I wish I had done this more when I was going through my treatment. Social media, just like you can be scrolling and all of a sudden it's a picture of a baby. It can be so triggering. You know, your friend who you haven't connected with since high school, all of a sudden is having her third child and you're on your third intrauterine insemination. And so learn how to edit your social media feed. If you have accounts that are triggering, you can unfollow them. But another option, if you don't want them to know that you unfollowed them, <laughs> but you don't really want to see them, you can mute. There's an incredible feature in social media feeds where you can mute an account so it doesn't come into your feed. So tailor your feed for what is right for you. Number three, prepare for emotional surprises. So even if you edit your social media feed, you know, sometimes a baby picture is going to sneak in there. You can be walking down the street and turn the corner and you see a stroller. You could walk by a playground. Your, you know, sister could announce that she's pregnant at Christmas time. Like just all of these things, like there are emotional bombs that happen. <laughs> while you're trying to build your family. And so by being prepared for it, I love what this author says. She says, make up a mantra that you can say to yourself when these emotional bombs happen. And hers is, that'll be me one day. That'll be me one day. So you see the baby stroller and it's, you know, you feel your heart racing. You're kind of getting upset. Your cortisol levels are going through the roof. You're anxious. That'll be me someday. That'll be me someday. And just be ready to say it and just make that your mantra. Even if you don't believe it, like in that moment, just say it, just say it and make it your mantra. I love that piece of advice. Number four, I wish I had known it's a marathon, not a sprint. We put so much into that first IUI cycle. We put so much into that first IVF cycle. And I'm counseling my patients, you know, I want your first attempt at a fertility treatment to be successful, but 
nothing is 100% guaranteed. So don't just put all of your hopes and dreams into that one try because it might take a little bit longer than you're hoping for. It's just not a sprint. And so it's a marathon. So that means just like take care of yourself along the way. You can't completely compartmentalize your life and be like, okay, so for the next two months, I'm going to be totally focused on IVF because, you know, in December, I am going to be pregnant and then I can focus on the rest of my life, work and all that other kind of stuff later. You just have to kind of go at a pace where you're able to focus on everything that you need to focus on, but also do your fertility treatments or whether you're just trying at home. It is a marathon, not a sprint. Number five, be proactive with the fertility clinic. So the author is specifically talking about if you're going through IVF, be sure and ask questions, et cetera. I recommend being proactive throughout your entire fertility journey. Ask for testing. Realize that most primary care doctors, including primary obstetricians and gynecologists, do not have training in fertility. So get to a fertility specialist. And when you're there, if it is not a good connection, if you do not feel heard, if your questions aren't answered, get another opinion. You know, if you go through your fertility treatment, get a second opinion, you know, advocate for your care. Got a great video here on how to find a fertility specialist as well as red flags when it comes to fertility doctors. So it can give you some tips on how to find that right place to receive your care. Number six, keep track of everything. Everything. This is such good advice actually for all aspects of medicine. I think I eternally want to be optimistic and I wanted to assume that my first IUI would be successful and it wasn't or that my first embryo transfer would be successful and it wasn't. But it's really important to keep track of your test results, your treatment protocols, your embryology reports. Like, yes, it's in the system. And if you're at your clinic, they'll be able to find these things. But what if you get a second opinion or what if you just need to know this information for some reason? and just keep track of things. And you should do that throughout your whole life. You should always keep a list of what medications you're taking. You should keep track of when your last pap smear was. I know that the doctors keep track of it, but people move and you see other doctors for questions or a different type of doctor. Like just keep track of your medical information. It'll save you a lot of heartache and frustration in the future. Number seven, it's not an exact science. Oh, this is so true. Fertility treatment, IVF, medicine in general, it's an art. Every person is different. Every protocol is a little bit different. Every lab is a little different. So it's not just everyone needs to do this exact same protocol to have success. Or if your friend did something at a different clinic with a different doctor, or even in your same clinic with your same doctor, you know, we are all different and each patient is unique and it is just not all black and white or an exact science. That goes for when you're keeping track of what's going on with your own treatment. You know, we're human and we look for comfort and patterns and predictability. And sometimes it can get frustrating when you're expecting to ovulate from your right ovary, but it's your left ovary two months in a row, or you're doing a second IVF stimulation cycle. And last time you had, you know, 12 follicles and this time you only have 10. You know, every cycle Every person is unique. And if one thing keeps us guessing and is unpredictable, it is those ovaries. So just take every cycle as it comes, keep track of things, but also just realize like there are differences and just allow for that lack of predictability or that lack of, you know, consistency because it is the human body. Number eight, I like this one. Not all days are going to be bad days. Mm whether it's a negative pregnancy test or you get a period when you weren't expecting it, whether you're having side effects from your fertility treatment, or you're early in pregnancy and, and having difficulty with that. There are going to be bad days, just like in every aspect of our life, but not all days are going to be bad days. I really like that point. Number nine, I can still do things that my friends who are parents can't. I really like this. You know, I didn't think about that. I was so laser focused on becoming a mom when I wanted to that I didn't, you know, just kind of enjoy a little bit of time where it was just my husband and me. You know, I did enjoy it, but it's not like, I mean, to make it like conscious, you know, like, yes, we're trying, but okay, we can, you know, pick up and go. We don't have to get a babysitter. We can go to that friend's birthday party or go to that wedding or whatever. I just kind of like just sitting in the realization and having a little bit of gratitude for one part of your life when the other part isn't doing so great. You know, we are made up of different parts and it's just choosing to focus 
on something that is a little bit positive. And I also like that the author brought up that if you're having secondary infertility, like you're trying to add to your family, but you already have a baby or a child or two, this is a unique time where eventually you're going to add to your family. You can kind of stay positive. That'll be me someday. But you have more time with just that one child, that one-on-one relationship, or if it's two kids or whatever it is, nobody's going to tell you when your family is complete. I really like that too. Like, yes, you want to add a sibling or you want to, you know, add to your family, but you can also at the same time, enjoy the time that you have with the family that is in the present. Number 10, making future plans is really hard. And this is true. And this is a really hard part of the fertility journey. So trying to, you know, make plans for holidays. Well, are you going to be pregnant or are you not going to be pregnant? Or making plans for the summer. Well, do I want to do the egg retrieval in June or August? I got those weddings. You know, just so much of life is kind of like on hold and hurry up and wait. And just it is hard to make future plans. And so when my patients are really struggling with things, trying to figure things out. And sometimes they'll say like, oh my gosh, like I really wanted to do the cycle, but you know, my ovaries aren't cooperating right now. So maybe I should just cancel that trip to Italy that we've been planning for a year because I really want to do another cycle. I say, go to Italy. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, of course, if they want to postpone the trip and focus on another cycle, of course we'll do that. But I really encourage them not to completely stop life outside of fertility treatments and to really find that joy because you can always do a cycle when they get back. Number 11. So this is one point that I don't really agree with. The author says like, get ready to have fun with travel size beauty products, because what she's trying to say is that her current beauty regimen, like lotions and face creams and stuff is not pregnancy friendly. And so she doesn't want to buy big bottles of lotion. She wants to buy little small ones so that when she gets pregnant, you know, she isn't wasting a big bottle. I totally disagree with that. So I think that you should choose products you're in entire life that are great for your reproductive health or pregnancy health, if possible, because that's only going to help your overall health and well-being. So when you're trying to get pregnant, these products are being seen by your eggs or by sperm. And so I don't think you should drastically change everything once you're pregnant. I think you should try to think about your reproductive health even before you start trying, quite honestly. So I have a lot of information on toxins and endocrine disruptors and reproductive health. Several videos here on parabens, on BPA. You can also find more information on my website, my blog, and my books. I always have chapters on lifestyle optimization and include endocrine receptors and ways we can decrease exposures to plastics and kitchens and products that we use. I definitely disagree with this particular point, although I love this article. <laughs> Number 12, don't blame yourself and don't live in regret. This is a really important point. People make choices in the present that are right for them. And so we just can't look backwards and say, you know, I shouldn't have chosen this career. I should have started my family sooner or, you know, I don't know, just whatever it is, like don't live in regret. It is what it is. Let it go and focus on what you are doing right now to build your family. This is a really good thing to remember. Number 13, find supportive resources. Yes, I absolutely agree with this. Like this YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. So the resources that are mentioned in the article are some books and a podcast. Uh, one of the books that she mentions is The Trying Game. A second book is It Starts with the Egg with Rebecca Fett. I love that book. Rebecca Fett is an amazing human, and she has written an incredible book looking at all of the information on what you can do to improve your egg quality. And she goes through supplements. She goes through toxins and endocrine disruptors. I love how much research she shares. One thing that I talk about and my patients, most of my patients have read that book is, you know, don't just open it up and take absolutely everything that she mentions. Like she's just going through the research. It doesn't mean that you have to take every single thing. And you know, research changes. So she has a second edition because a lot of information came out between her first and second edition. And I learned a lot from her and uh, just kind of a fun little note. If you turn over and look on the back cover of the second 
edition, uh, that's me. I endorsed the book. And what I loved about Rebecca's second edition is she really recognized that in her first edition, a lot of the language talking about endocrine disruptors and toxins left people very, very scared. You know, she didn't mean to, but it was just a lot of really, really bad news about toxins and how they affect your egg quality and your sperm quality and miscarriage risk without a lot of, oh, but and this, like if you do change your products, if you do change what you're eating and have less processed food, you actually do see improved sperm counts and better egg quality and outcomes with fertility treatment. And she also really points out that a lot of the literature is really looking at it's only people with the highest levels of BPA, parabens, phthalates in their system that show this impact on their reproductive health that was present, but she just didn't say it in the same way. And so I was so excited when she came out with the second edition and that's why. I endorsed it. The author also recommends the Egg Whisperer podcast by my friend, Dr. Amy Avazade. Fertility community is very small and we pretty much all know each other and full of wonderful people. Dr. Avazade, she practices down in California. She has an incredible podcast, just so much good information. So in addition to the resources that are mentioned in the article by the author, Sarah Levy, I would recommend my books. If you want to learn about a general overview of fertility, both from an Eastern medicine perspective and a Western med medicine perspective, I recommend my book, Planting the Seeds of Pregnancy, an Integrative Approach to Fertility Care. I co-wrote it with a dear friend and a licensed fertility and board certified acupuncturist, Stephanie Gianarelli. And I'm really proud of that book. You go through Eastern approaches and Western approaches, and it's a really good overview of fertility care. It would help somebody who is just getting started with their fertility journey. It would also help somebody who is not being successful with Eastern care, wants to think about Western or opposite. If someone's in Western care, like doing IVF and how could they integrate Eastern care into their fertility treatment? So I think that's a really good book for a lot of different people. And then of course, if you are having miscarriages, especially more than one miscarriage, which is the definition of recurrent pregnancy loss, my book, Not Broken, An Approachable Guide to Miscarriage and Recurrent Pregnancy Loss. You can find both of these books on Amazon. I go through definition of miscarriage. I go through testing and and controversies in care and treatment, lifestyle optimization. I have a whole chapter on male impact of miscarriage risk. Another resource is resolve.org, a fantastic patient-run nonprofit that has a great website with information on insurance coverage state by state. They run support groups throughout the country, both in person and virtual, to help with going through this process. You are not alone. So these are wonderful support groups. So resolve.org is a good resource. Other podcasts I love are As a Woman podcasts podcast by my friend Natalie Crawford. I love Ali Prado's podcast, Infertile AF. And then please check out my podcast, Baby or Bust. Really proud of this podcast. You can listen to it anywhere you listen to podcasts. It is interviewing a lot of leaders in our field and reflecting on many aspects of fertility in our society and within ourselves and treatment options. One particular episode that just blows me away is my second season. I was able to interview Louise Brown, the very first IVF baby born in 1978. That is an incredible episode and just like a highlight, quite honestly, of my career it was really incredible. So I hope those resources are really helpful. And I love that the author is emphasizing finding good and supportive resources on your journey. And finally, number 14, I can't decide what to share and with whom should I share my journey. But I think what the author is really pointing out, and I appreciate this too, is learn to set your boundaries. You can share as much or as little as you want on your journey. I think it's important to set boundaries. Like if you do start sharing with people and then they start over asking or, you know, over advising you on what you should do, it's okay to just say, thanks, I've got my doctors to help me, or I know you're really trying to help, but you know, what I really want you to do is just be supportive and I'll bring it up if I want to talk about it in the future. So just setting boundaries, whether it is learning how to mute people on your social media feeds or just taking a break from social media altogether, whether it is surrounding yourself with people that you know are going to lift you up and support you, avoiding time with people that 
don't understand your fertility journey and don't really want to learn to understand. There's kind of a difference there. Setting boundaries is really important. So this was an excellent article, 14 Things I Wish I Knew Before IVF. As a fertility doctor and an IVF patient, I really appreciated this article and a lot of the points that this author made. She said at the end of the article, you know, she was really nervous about sharing this, but she's going through IVF herself. And this is coming from her heart that she really did want to share with other people who are in this journey, the things that she wished she knew before she started. And I really appreciate it. I hope you learned something from this video. Like this video if you learned something. Comment with questions that you have subscribe to this channel so you do not miss my weekly videos and as always stick around for more learning